This is the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast, Episode 10, with our guest, Robert Dyer. I hear the term old school, new school, and I think it's important to understand that it's not a competition between old and new, and it's not a competition between human versus technology. I think that it's what's the best answer for our customers and what their needs are. And some of that depends on geography. Some of that depends on demographics. There's no doubt in my mind that the fitness industry, new or old school, they're going to have to adopt technology as we move forward. Welcome to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast for club owners, operators, and fitness professionals. I am your host, Josh Trent, and this is your number one trusted resource for the accelerating world of fitness technology. Each week, we bring you an expert interview with a global influencer at the crossroads of fitness and technology. You'll gain the insights, tools, and inspiration you need to stay connected to the pulse of what matters most for your fitness business in the age of exponential technologies. This podcast is brought to you by support from our outstanding sponsors. Brian O'Rourke and his family of companies, including Videri Ventures, Integris Advisors, Moon Mission Media, and many more. If you're looking for unmatched guidance, capital, insights, or a great speaker or facilitator, Brian and his partners are the go-to resource for your organization. To learn more, visit briankoorourke.com. We'd also like to thank the Fitness Industry Technology Council, your nonprofit resource for reliable technology information supported by forward-looking brands who are seeking to drive increased technology adoption in the fitness industry. Make a difference and join at fittechcouncil.org today. On episode 10, we're learning from industry veteran, speaker, and author, Robert Dyer. Robert is coming on the show today to talk about technology and the one thing that hasn't changed about the fitness industry. I'm sure you've probably heard of Robert or read something from his work in the past 30 years in fitness. Rather you've heard of his work or not, this show is gonna be perfect timing for you. As technology has grown so much in the past two years, Robert reminds us about that human side and the bridge between technology and human connection. As Robert is gonna explain the gap between old school traditional club operations versus new school, you'll learn from Robert about the best practices he put in place to support Les Mills and managing over 800 facilities and 5,000 fitness professionals. He'll explain real life on the ground versus the perception of what technology clubs should be using. You'll learn how to know who to trust for quality information in a busy digital world and what Robert believes holds club operators back from using technology to create those time gaps for proactive team meetings that will foster productivity and connection. I think you're really going to love this episode with Robert as much as I did. So let's get right into the show with Robert Dyer. Robert Dyer is the principal at Integris LLC and a global ambassador with more than 30 years of operating health clubs, consulting to and advising fitness facility owners, global suppliers, and developing organizations. Robert and his partners have advised brands around the world. His fitness career began in the early 80s when he founded and served as the CEO of Fort Worth Fit for Life health club chains. And in 2006, he became CEO and founder of Fitmark. His philanthropic efforts have focused on helping and coaching people who can benefit from his experience and focus forward-looking insights. Robert's reputation of building relationships that matter and humanizing the health and fitness industry are well known to the people he has worked with over the years. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate it, Josh. Man, th- I got to reflect back at all those things that you said. It's been so long. Yes, it's been <laughs> quite a road. It's been three decades for you. We so appreciate you spending time with us on the show. You know, we were talking, we've been discussing technology and club operations for the past couple of weeks leading up to our interview. And there was one thing you said to me that stuck. And I think it's a beautiful way we can paint the picture for the show. And it's the one thing that hasn't changed with all this technology and all the club operations that are moving at a rapid pace is people and human connection. This is a people business. Robert, why do you think that no matter what happens with technology, that people will always be the focus for the fitness industry? It has to be, in my view, Josh. It, it, it absolutely has to be because without the people, then none of this other has a real purpose because of what we're measure, measuring in data, whether it's technology, biometrics, whatever it is, it's about people. And so r- remove that element from this, and there's really very little in our industry to talk about besides brick and mortar machines, technology, and things like this that uh, that uh, everyone makes and creates. And so the people side of this, Josh, is, is I think sometimes gets lost in that shuffle of so much about technology, which I love technology. You, as you know, my 
friend and business partner, Brian O'Rourke, is he's right there at the cutting edge of it. And so we have lots of conversations about this. But, you know, when we get grounded, it's back to the people, mm-hmm. to me. And, and, and I say people, when I said that to you, I was relating to the people that own the clubs, that are investors, the people in the management, the people that are on the ground working in the personal trainers and the group all of those levels, Josh, and then the people that actually pay us, pay us for our services and the things that we do. And so people to me has always been number one through all the smoke and mirrors, through all the new stuff that's come out in 30 years. It it goes back to the people to me. And you began, I mean, this is the 1980s here. So you had one of the first keyless entry facilities in the U.S. That's how deep your roots go in the industry. I mean, it's pretty incredible to see the changes, right? Has there been anything that surprised you in the last 30 years in regards to either technology or the fitness industry? Really, the, the technology side has really has really um, changed the game, so to speak, and how we how we work and how we interact with our customers. The industry itself, as far as breaking up into different segments, it used to be health clubs, brick and mortar, and now it's gone. You, you have the boutiques, the studios, you have the, the all the different variations of communicating with people. So our industry isn't about brick and mortar only anymore like it was back in the 80s. And I've seen those transitions for 30 years to what it is now. And I actually love it. Yeah. The, the way that, you know, we've been stuck in the United States, Josh, into this number of, depending on who you talk to, a percentage of the population that we touch that have been members of our clubs and things like that. And I think that's dynamic is shifting towards being a bigger number of people with better quality. Uh, I think that that's critical to our future. And so that's, I'm excited about the things that I've seen change. And I also remember the roots of where we came from. Yeah. And I know we're going to get into old school and new school and things like that. But, yeah, there's some things that are important about the history of our industry as well. Well, let's talk about your time with Fitmark. I mean, you were the regional distributor for Les Mills. And now they were the number one. Are they still the number one Group X program on the planet? Or has that changed? Yes. As far as in the choreographed space, you know, the difference in the freestyle versus choreographed. In the choreographed space, yes, sir, because it's two different things. It, that, that's a tough space to be in right now, Josh. It's very competitive due to technology and on demand and subscription models and things like that. It, that's a tough space, even though they're in that space as well. Mm. Uh, it's tough to compete against all that and maintain a constant number one rating because everyone's always coming at you. <laughs> and things move so quickly, Robert. Everything from the way that we interact with customers, from the way that a trainer trains their client, and from the way that somebody even moves and checks into a gym, their locker space, everything is being technology-focused right now. You know, Les Mills and the company you had, it was 800 facilities you were working with, and you had over 5,000 instructors and fitness professionals. You were responsible for sales and marketing and customer support, training, ongoing education. When you look back on Les Mills, I mean, why do you think it was so successful? Did they hinge on the technology or did they focus more on the people? Most of most of the focus, I would say, in that 75 percent of it was on the people and creating content that was appealing to people that was trending. Uh, Some programs that were mainstays in our industry and have been for a long time. And then adding to that menu, Josh, things as they grew. And uh, of course, on the technology side now, they're in the on-demand and subscription models. So they've made some changes themselves, same content, yeah, things like that. And um, they've been good at building relationships. What would you say made the biggest difference for you over the past 30 years in looking at things that are trending that'll actually apply to you becoming better as a professional. How do you stay on top of things with so much information out there? Well, there is a lot in there. So much. It's like an ocean. You know, I have people, Josh, that uh, there are people that are the core 
folks that I believe in their philosophies. Doesn't mean I agree with everything, but I believe in them. I believe yeah. there's that should be my core group. And then I had these subsets of folks that I follow and interact with that uh, are not on the top, on the A list, but they're also but they're, they're good people. And um, sometimes I end up having conversations with them. They just want to come in the office back to the human thing. It's like, and they'll say, you know, well, Robert, I'm going to be in Dallas. Can, would you have time for me to come by your office? I'll make time. So that happens to me all the time. And I think that those are the things that I pay attention to. I, I really do categorize folks as to what I'm going to spend the time on in my 168 hours. And if you narrow that down, there's not very many if you eat, sleep, and work. Well, let's jump into what the landscape looks right now, Robert. I mean, you interface with club owners all the time. This is your life. This is what you do. When we look at what's happening on the floor right now, you know, maybe we could just call it old school versus the new school. The new school being augmented reality, virtual reality, streaming classes, virtual classes, using wearables as trainers with their clients. What's on the floor right now that club owners are really preoccupied with? What does the landscape look like right now as far as old school? Well, if I could say this here in the beginning about about this topic, I hear the term old school, new school, and I, I think it's important to understand that it's not a competition between old and new, and it's not a competition between human versus technology. I think that it's what's the best answer for our customers and what their needs are. And some of that depends on geography. Some of that depends on demographics that our particular model is serving. Those are some factors that go into this. And I'll, I'll say this too, there's no doubt in my mind that the fitness industry, new or old school, they're going to have to adopt technology as we move forward. Yeah. And um, I hear a lot of people say it's this demographic or that demographic driven I think it's everybody. I'm 62 years old and I use this stuff as well. All, I've, I've got numerous brands of my own wearables and, and, and apps that I use. So uh, my mom uses it. She's 81 years old. Uh, All right. So it's, it, you know, it's, it, I think a lot of people put so much emphasis on which demographic we're serving. And I'm not sure that that's the best way I would go about it. It would be that there are people that that we need to show and coach on how this could improve the quality of their life. Old school in the in the term for this for this podcast is, um, you know, these are people that um, uh, have had a tough time adopting the new technologies. Josh, I know you've been to lots of conferences, as we all have in our industry, if we if we're staying on top of things. And I've left many speaking engagements that had really good content about the things it can do and all the biometrics and how we're going to use this and how we're going to be healthier and how this is going to start communicating with in the healthcare, how it crosses over into healthcare and different things. And then as you're walking, I think I even said this to you in a, when we talked is, you can be walking out of the out of the meeting room and down the hall to go to your next meeting, and people are going, "That was great stuff." I just don't know where to start. Right. So I think there's a huge gap there. So many people are talking about how cool they are, the great benefits and the value, but where we're missing things, I believe, is how do we approach this? If I've been in business for thirty years and my business is obviously I've been 30 years. It's, it's, it's worked. I've, I've expanded getting to that point of how do I do this? How do I execute this? And I think those are some of the things that, that we were going to talk about at some point in the interview, but I really feel like it gets back to that is the how mm. you can't help but walk out of those presentations excited and all fired up about it. And then you, you get home and you look at your notes and you're going, where do I start? It's such a great point because there's real life on the ground as a club owner and as a trainer. 
And then there's technology and the perceived, you know, what they should be doing by looking online. So right now on the ground, a club operator, an owner, they're busy doing their daily activities. They're training clients, they're checking in members, they're filling out forms, they're doing all kinds of meetings. So taking a breath and taking a 30,000 foot view on how their club is running, that can be the challenge, Robert, right? They're doing so many things. It's, it's yes, how do we actually get in there and educate people, educate club owners on what they get to be doing through this new technology? technology and not let them get lost in the details of just running their business every day. I think it starts with what I would do first, Josh, is that I would bring the specialist in and I would have a meeting with my team, number one, and talk about how we're going to be better and how we're going to stay in business and job security and growth and what are those strategies we're going to use. And and really, to me, until you get the buy-in, from the people that are on the ground and doing the work when we're not there, when I'm not in my clubs, you've, you've got to really get the buy-in and be able to answer the real questions and let them know that you sincerely want to know what their concerns are and address those things. And then number two, once you've done that the best of your ability, there's some things we're not going to be able to answer because it's going to involve the technology and how this is going to affect my customers as a personal trainer and et cetera, because I like everyone that worked for me to take ownership of what they do. Right. So when I say my customers, I don't mean they're it's, it's our, our companies, but the way I want them to look at it and to take ownership of it and then bring in the organization or the specialist or the consultant that's going to show us where we start. Cause if you start going through one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you, they get lost. What's the first thing we're going to do? What's, let's timeline this. Mm-hmm. What's the second thing we're going to do? And I wouldn't go any further than that. And let's get this to where it's working at a high level in our organization. And then we're going to look at what's next. Because you could say, yeah, we need to be doing all this. We're a little behind. But if you don't execute it correctly, then it doesn't – the ROI on it, the penetration of, of – People actually using what you're, what you've invested in, and your team's on board with, yeah. becomes a mute point. So I think that you have to go through this. It's a little bit of common sense sometimes, but sometimes you know the old saying, my, where I live, is sometimes common sense isn't common, and and you know it's it, it's those things that sometimes a club owners you identify they're so busy doing things that. They do have to step back and take that deep breath, as as you described, and that's a great way to put it, and meet with their key people. And you know what I found that's amazing, Josh, is that when I sit down with 30, 40, 50 employees that I would have in my clubs and we had these discussions about things, is that they had way better ideas than I did. And I loved when, when they start to share those things and it becomes apparent to you that, you know, this has been on their mind or they've read this or they've seen that because, they, you know, I would get them engaged in certain subscriptions of how to keep up with what's trending in the industry, et cetera, stay on top of their game and their certifications. Yeah, I, I think you got to have that for a 30,000 foot view to me is – your team buying. It doesn't matter what I like or what I think. It's getting those people that that work for us, that work with us to, to buy into it. And a lot of people approach this, and I've seen them do it, from a strong arm position versus a coaching position. And I don't think that's human in a human nature manner works as productively. And so – we can say we're doing this and people not even understand what we're doing. Yeah. And I'm flashing back to my time with 24 hour fitness before I went to a private studio. And I can remember most of our meetings in 24 hour fitness were about closeout and they were about what kind of profit we were bringing in. And that's necessary. But what I'm hearing from you is that what's equally necessary is having meetings about what's happening in six months, what's happening in 12 months so that the team can collectively come together. What do you think holds club operators back from having those kind of meetings? I think they're in reactive mode, Josh, versus proactive. And I know that's a broad statement, but they are busy doing things. And, I, and 
the, by using technologies and again, if they take, if they back up and they take that deep breath and look at it, they could work so much more efficiently in their business and have more time to do the things that really matter instead of the things they were used to doing by utilizing certain technologies. For example, equipment, one of the biggest investments a, co- a club owner will make in their, in their business mm-hmm. is n- knowing the status of that equipment beside, before it breaks down. There's, there's, uh, there's, a- there's applications and companies that do that. Being able to say, I want a customized report sent to me on my mobile device at the end of each day is the status of all my equipment. And let's proactively uh, not have to wait till there's an out of order sign put on a treadmill to know that it's down or no one sees that it's down. They just think no one's using it Mm. for three or four days, but the, the club members, the members know it and they get on it. Then you see them get off and get on another one. So I think that those type of things, if smart club owners would look at adopting, I think that, it would help them to be better at what they're doing and spend. It's them making that mind shift of focusing on the right things and allowing what's available in technology to help them manage the things that they're spending too much time on where they could at a glance look and see the status of whatever it may be. Is there a roadmap for this type of change, for the technology adoption for an operator, for an executive at a club? And what what might this map look like for change? I think you had mentioned a lot of club operators know and they see online what they should be doing versus what they're doing on the ground. What's that map look like? I think that that roadmap could vary, but the fundamental things is that you and I have to be convinced this is better for our customers and better for our employees to be more productive so that you, as if you were a trainer, you could do more. It was scalable. You could be more productive yourself. And so it has to be what's in it for me in a way, but not in a greedy way, but in a, a team manner and what's better for us as we all grow together. And I think it helps them to feel like they've got skin in the game, so to speak. Like I said earlier, I, I, I think, some of the best input I've gotten from people is people on our own team that when you give them an opportunity to share what their thoughts are uh, without any consequences or in just an open, you know, transparency, you can't be transparent and then go have a meeting in the back room about transparency. The, mm-hmm. you, it is what it is or it's not. And so I want to hear the good, the bad, the ugly. Because those are things we're going to face at some point by someone. If they're thinking it's where well, they're not going to be the only one. So th- hit me with it. Let's talk. About, let's get all this on the table now. And I think the resistance comes when the transparency isn't there, right? Maybe a business is operating from a top level only, but they're not opening up all the levels for clear channels. You know, it's interesting, Robert, on your personal site, we'll link this in our show notes today. You were quoted. You said, I don't like to ask someone to do something I'm not willing to do myself. Obviously, as we grow, we can't be everywhere at the same time. But keeping this in mind makes you think about whether something's really that important. It's exactly what we've been discussing today. If a club owner or a manager or a trainer lead or a trainer manager, anyone who's in a position of leadership at a club, if they're not willing to do what they're telling other people to do, maybe it involves technology or or a process change. It's not going to work for the people that are just starting out. It's not going to work for the front desk agent. It's not going to work for that beginning trainer. What do you think can tie everything together is it getting as you discussed that buy-in having the third party the strategy piece come in for implementation i mean what's going to make this team be cohesive in the long run using tech one of the things and you touched on lead by example i think that it's really important that that we do those things that we understand the the ups and downs of, of making a change and i think what binds it all together to make it work, Josh, would be that it's for the benefit of our customers. That has to be towards the top, you know, and and, and the betterment of our employees and our team because they have to be considered too, how this is going to help them to be be better and more productive and uh, expand their career opportunities. Um, 
I think that's really huge is that what we do, Josh, I believe is by doing these type of things that we're creating career paths for other people on our team that may not be with us in the future. They're not going to be with, they're going to grow and they're going to go on. And the more that we can expose them to these type of interactions and decision-making processes, the more successful I believe they'll be on their own someday. It would be my dream that all the employees that I've worked with, and I've had many of them that have done this, that have gone in business for themselves. I've financed it for them sometimes. You know, you believe in something or you fall for anything. And I, I really believe in our team because it doesn't matter what I think sometimes, Josh. Most of the time, it's what's happening out there face to face on the phone why we're going to reach out to these inactive people and how does this help us from an acquisition mode? How does this help us from a retention mode? How does this help us from uh, people just being healthier and, and word of mouth is still, you know, back to the people thing. The, one of the strongest things in the world for me, mm -hmm. if you recommended something, I'm way more likely to take a look at it than receiving a blast from somebody that, because my inbox, you were all of our inboxes are full of that. So um, it's really hard to get off of how important the folks that are going to execute this um, are involved. It's hard to get away from that as far as how do you implement it. What I'm hearing from you that's the most important throughout our discussion today was getting the emotional and psychological buy-in from the entire staff. That, to me, seemed like the overwhelming point of everything we've discussed. Robert, what are your thoughts as we wrap up the interview around balancing technology with people? How can we use these new technologies that are coming out with human touch and with these human touch points? You know, Josh, there has to be a reason, um, a defined reason to me why we should make a change. And I think that the, the processes that we've gone through today, that this helps to helps us to decide and process which, which things are important the most, which are the most important things first. Back to the why and then the who, the technologies and which one we choose are the ones that we need, depending on our situation. I mean, some people really want to complicate that. But it is what we need, not what someone thinks we need. It's tell me why we need that. Unless it's not an argument. It's, a, it's an informative question. It, it's an information gathering process. And sometimes I'm surprised at what I get. And they're right. And I love it when they're right. And they love it when they're right. And guess what? They're going to champion that. Sure. And um, – so I'm probably the old school guy, if you're going to categorize me, Josh, as far as believing in the people. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very difficult to execute any of these things. Uh, we can think we're executing them. Go back to the big box stores and clubs and things like what they think happens and happens in the boardroom isn't happening on the ground. Uh and the results are not what they projected. And the reason is, is there's no real heartfelt buy-in from the people that are doing it every day. That is such a skill set, isn't it? Yes. To have people to, to create the space as a leader in any fitness organization, to be able to get that buy-in from everyone on the ladder. I think that is something that a third party integration, having a company come in, whether it's a technology focused company or an operations company, you know, I mean, let's be honest, when you're in the fishbowl, it's kind of hard to see outside of it, right? Yeah. So getting that third party view, getting somebody on the outside to come in who's done this with other clubs like yourself, Robert, if I'm a club owner and I'm listening and if I'm running my day to day gym operations and I feel a little bit exhausted, I know I should be looking at some change pieces. What would you say as parting guidance to somebody who's running a club who's really busy? Where do they turn their head and look for new technologies? How do they integrate this? What are the first steps? You know, it's, uh, that's a really good question. You've got to start with, Josh, with what impacts the most to your, to your business model first. If they don't have 
the right interactive type, say, website and everything else is feeding into it. And if they haven't taken the time and thought through how to integrate this with not only now that they've got their team on board, but the customer, the people that walk in the door every day that that allow us to do what we do. I used to have a thing, you know, uh, years ago where name recognition was such a big deal to me that I'd put up bonuses to the to the receptionist. You notice I didn't say front desk. You know why? Why? A front desk is a piece of wood or for mica or or something. A reception is a person that actually is a person. Yeah. They greet another person. But anyway, it's I used to have these contests where I would, uh, if you could tell me the name of the first, the next 25 people that walk in, call them by name without looking at the screen, then here's this. And I'm going to stand right here with you and greet them and hand them their towel and walk them 10 or 15 feet into the door depending on the time, whether it's a peak or off peak or shoulder time of the day, uh, that you can do things like that. And to have every person meet two or three new people a day, get away from that inner circle of people that you always talk to. And you'd be surprised at how you expand and cast that web, that network to where you're engaging more people, the one that no one has really talked to. And so these are fundamental things to me that allow these things you and I have talked about today to happen because it's about relationships. And so, you know, I believe in a relationship that I should do something before I ask for something. And I believe that if I do that, I'm going to be successful and I'm not doing it for monetary reasons. I'm doing it because that's how I feel. I think why people, and I've learned, I've learned to not be this way, but I think it's easy when you're just starting out to want to do so much and accomplish so much as an early trainer or even a, you know, a fitness club owner, whatever it is, that you're willing to go to any networking and do anything it takes. And it becomes so mentally focused to get what you're needing and to get something for you that you forget about the mission. You forget about why you're doing this in the first place, which is to help people let go of old weight and to help people get healthier in their life. And that becomes like a tertiary, like a second thing. People get so wrapped up and I'm not getting the money I want. I'm not getting the recognition I want. I'm not getting the growth I want. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that they forget. Oh yeah. The reason I'm actually here in the first place is because I'm trying to serve as many people as possible. They forget about that because they're so focused on like what they're not getting at that moment. So definitely connected with your message. I really believe by having that mentality about it, that attitude that the other will come, the other opportunities are going to be there. The, the other relationships are going to come your way. And I think that's true to most folks that have a passion and drive and are doing the right things. And we're all going to stumble. We're all going to get confused. We're all going to do those human things. And there's not anything wrong with it. We just keep moving, put one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward and stick to your real values. Don't ignore your own gut feeling instincts because to me, that's your barometer. That's your that's your checkpoint. That's where if something feels wrong, it probably is. Is there anything that you think we didn't talk about, Robert, when we look at this old school versus the new school, the club operations? You know, all these apps and the wearables and all the things that are happening in technology that for us to always remember that there's only 168 hours a week. And then you start deducting the number of hours you sleep and that you work and then you do these things that whatever it is that we do and, and they, they need to take care of their health for lots of reasons. Um, some of the things you and I have addressed today are not things that I hear as common conversation anymore, Josh. It's more of everything else. And sometimes the coaches need a little coaching. Mm. The leaders need a little leading on how to be better at this, because if they're really good at this, these people are going to go and make this work. If, if they think they're going to just top down, you know the results of that. 
Thank you so much for coming on this show. You know, on one side of our coin, we have technology. On the other side, we have humanity. I feel like you do a phenomenal job of being that bridge between the two. People can learn more about you at robertjdyer.com. We're going to link your Twitter, your Facebook. You can reach out to Robert if you have questions. If Robert said anything on today's episode that made you want to dig a little deeper, Robert, can they reach out to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So many methods. And my, you know, my email is robert at fitmart.com. Um, as well. So yes, sir, I'm, I'm available. I do this all day long and I I love it, Josh. I love doing it. And I so appreciate you taking the time because I've seen all the folks you've interviewed and there's some big players there that I know and like a great deal. So highly respect. So I appreciate you letting me be on one of your podcasts. And we'll definitely check in with you in 2017. Maybe we'll have you back around as this technology grows. You can remind us how to be more human. Thank you, sir. When it comes to new programs, operational policies, and technology systems to be effective and sustainable, all leadership must truly lead by their own example. Clear communication about the benefits to both staff and customers from any technology program initiatives must be demonstrated from all levels for success. Some of the best input a club operator can ever receive from trainers and staff comes from an environment of transparency that is demonstrated from the top down. For all and any successful new technology integrations to work in a club, the enrollment conversation must happen from a place of collective feedback, not strong-arm tactics. In a sometimes noisy digital world, Robert believes it is important to take that time to create meaningful, personal, and authentic relationships beyond just digital. Technology is growing exponentially in our space, and with that, the opportunity to create those trusted connections are now more open than ever before. Thank you for spending some time with me on the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast. I want to thank our show sponsors, Brian O'Rourke and his family of companies, and the Fitness Industry Technology Council. You can learn more about becoming a valued partner with FitC at fittechcouncil.org and making an impact in your business with Brian's family of companies at briankoorourke.com. Pick up a copy of Brian and his partner Robert Dyer's recent book, The Nine Partnership Principles, A Story of Life Lessons, which is available on Amazon now. For more clarity and insights about the technology that matters for your fitness business, be sure to access your free download for the 2017 Technology Trends Report right from your phone by simply tapping on the show artwork and clicking on the link in purple. To support this podcast, if you enjoyed the show, leave us a five-star review by touching the link from your show artwork or at fittechcouncil.org forward slash review. Next week, we have another phenomenal show with an expert guest to inspire you at the crossroads of fitness and technology. So until I see you again next week, be well, have an amazing day, and go out there to connect online and offline with the people you care about most. 